everyone was on edge. Was that person injured? Were they dead? And of course, for some people, it was good news. For other people, it wasn't. But we have chaos with fans on the field, I'm afraid to say. We've got problems because the police have been guiding spectators out of the end, the way to my left-hand side. And some of those spectators have spilled onto the field. Something has gone badly wrong at that end of the ground where the Liverpool supporters are. We went in a minibus. It wasn't even a, a, it wasn't even a minibus, it was a van. So we all had, we had like, you know, we'd made our own seats in the back of a van, so it was like a blacked out. There was no windows in this thing. It was just a load of people piling into the back of a van with little sorts of seats that we'd made ourselves and a little table to play cards and some beer and stuff. Um, and just a load of excitement, really. Excitement, nice weather. Couldn't wait to get down there and, um, and get to the game. Picked us up nice and early so we could leave in plenty of time. Like I said, the weather was lovely, so I had me me away shirt on, so I just thought I looked cool in, you know. Uh, took me lucky scarf, so we were nailed on to win. And it was just a sense of uh, great anticipation. Just the average twenty-year-old lad who loves the footy. This was this was this was great. It was a lovely day, um, and there, there, there was nothing unusual about it, other than you know that we were going to an away match. Now it's half past one, and time to join John Inverdale for this afternoon's Sport on Two. Liverpool against Nottingham Forest and Everton against Norwich. It's FA Cup semi-final day. There was one or two alterations in the way that the police set them up um, the, the year before. I remember walking down a side street on the north stand side of the ground and getting stopped by police at one end of the road. And tickets checked and searched and walking the length of the street and getting stopped again and tickets checked and searched and let go. Well, there was, there was none of that in 89. We were at Leppins Lane and, and the congestion was building up. It, the turnstiles were so narrow. It was like a hole in the wall, bricks missing in the wall kind of thing. And and people were getting pushed towards that. And they could just there was just a feeling of congestion. But I went through the Constantina Gate that was opened in the end, because there were so many people trying to get through those, those turnstiles. The terrace wasn't full when I got in, a quarter past two. And it built up, steadily, as you'd expect, as you'd want to. I was um, looking forward to being in this terrace, a bit of bouncing round, a bit of you know, jumping up and down. If I'd have had the chance to buy a seat, if I had a chance of a better spec, I wouldn't have taken it. I was exactly where I wanted to be. In the world, in that moment, I wanted to be behind that goal. I must have been amongst the last, certainly the last couple of hundred or a few hundred um, to go into the pens. Um, so I couldn't understand why there was such a surge. And when I, when I realised that there was such a slope in the tunnel, um, that's what produced the surge. So the first main indication that I knew something was wrong was when I went down the tunnel into the Leppins Lane end. And um, and it was just so tight, you couldn't move. And I shouted to my mate who just got a few feet of, in front of me. And I shouted to him and I just said, let's just get out of here and go and watch it in the pub because it's 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 too there's too many people. And he sort of agreed. And when I tried to move, I was paralyzed from the neck down. I couldn't do anything. So it was all I could move was my head. Um, and then it's just an overwhelming panic set in then because I suddenly realized that I couldn't couldn't move if I wanted to. There was no way out of the situation I was in, and that was when the panic really hit. I always remember Peter Beardsley hitting the bar, because um, that would have killed hundreds. Because the difference between a ball going in, anyone who goes to match will tell you, the difference between a ball hitting the bar and a ball going in the net is huge, as a reaction, as a fan. So if, um, if Peter Beardsley had scored that day, then I probably wouldn't be here now. And hundreds, in my opinion, hundreds wouldn't. The crowd were uh, becoming distressed. We were shouting at the police officers down the front of us um, to open the gates, and let people out. People trying to get over the fence and getting pushed back in. Um, and people banging on the fence and uh, screaming at the coppers and, and what have you. And looking around me, you can see people's faces changing, you know. And, I was scared. So it just became really um, a matter of 
second by second. I, I didn't realise how bad it was, how bad it was going to be. It was just about trying to survive. There was people behind me, uh, bent over, leaning over the barriers that we, you know, got underneath, screaming for help. I specifically remember one fella just shouting, please, please, he's just shouting that. I, I gave up wasting my breath on shouting for help because they just weren't responding. In fact, they were making matters worse because people were literally getting pushed back in the pens. I was with me mate and we were right next to each other and we were obviously were talking to each other. So my hands are up here like this uh, and we were talking and we noticed a couple of lads had been crawling over the heads of people down to the gates at the front. Um, and trying, you know, and, and basically I'd seen escape. There's a little gate there, uh, the size of a small door at the front of the terrace. And we'd seen a couple of people manage to crawl over heads. And I hadn't thought of that. But in the vulnerable position I was in, um, I thought this is my only way out. And we, I, I could ease it with me mate, and uh, he was able somehow slowly to just inch, inch by inch move very slowly. I, I couldn't tell you the time, how long it took. But he was moving himself up slowly. So I was able, because my hand was like that, at some point I was able to grab hold of his trainee and he sprung onto the top of the crowd. And I shouted at get me out. But he had no way of leaving it himself, like crowd surfing. And he went down the front and I seen him escape and I thought, well, okay, me next day, I hope. And I was trying to leave him myself up. And some fellow who was obviously crushed up against us, who I wouldn't recognise if he was sitting next to me now. He uh, held his hand out and he went, see, yeah, mate, and helped, and helped me foot and... Um, it was dead surreal and I'm on top of this crowd in this crisis and um, I just crawled to the, um, the gate at the front and there was um, an officer at the front and it came up dead quick obviously because it was quite close to the front and as I came up to the, the um, I went to grab the top of the, the, the gate to get out, Honest Busy grabbed hold of me like by ear and he uh, pushed me back and said to me, and I quote, you fucking swat. People started lifting, trying to lift themselves out of, of the crowd around them to try and get out over the, over, the, over the gate. And what was happening with some people and that happened to me was the, a guy next to me put his elbow up, put his hands onto the shoulders of people in front of him and in doing it, he put his, his elbow into my neck and I couldn't breathe as it was. And then that was just forcing me windpipe even more. So the next thing you know, it, it was just black. Um, and uh, I've been through a, a near death experience. Newspaper was passed around the coach, and I think it hit me more then because the last thing on my mind was that it was our fault. I mean, I'd seen acts of heroism that, that, were, that were just dumbfounding. You know, I'd seen people ripping advertising hoardings up to use as stretches. I knew what had happened because I was there. I also knew the BBC cameras were there. So it's dead plain, isn't it? That's what happened. So for then someone to just invert it and say all these horrible things. I got a ticket for me, mate. He was killed in the same pen. He was a nice family man. He had two nice kids. They're still nice people. The media were blaming him and me and my mates. And he did nothing wrong. And neither did I. You see, when it first happened, I, was, I had chronic post-traumatic stress disorder for many years. PTSD, it's called. And, um, and the main thing is, is called survivor guilt. Um, you find it very hard to interact. Um, you feel guilty if, you, if you're enjoying yourself. And that goes on for... That was years, years of, of not really... Um, you can understand why people lost the plot, like, because you... Uh, you feel really guilty. Yeah, the Ilsby Justice campaign was started in 1998 between me and four families. It was um, it was set up in, in John Glover's house as the Hillsborough Survivors Relatives and Supporters Association. More and more as I got involved, you thought, this stinks, it really stinks, and there's a cover-up going on here. They all thought they were, they were untouchable, and it rocked. It rocked them to their very foundation, and, and that, that's something to be immensely proud of. And I think it was the 20th anniversary, I think, and it was just chocker. Nearly all the ground was full, nearly all of it. Um, and Andy Burnham turned up. I know he was a guest of Steve Rotherham's, who's been a huge supporter of, of the campaign. And, um, 
And I think he was, he was shocked, really shocked by the venom in the crowd. The single voice shouting out, what about just justice? What about justice for the 96? And that building up to a crescendo within the ground of everyone shouting justice for the 96. Clearly made a mark on Andy Burnham because um, he was visibly, visibly shaken, and then he vowed to uh, to go back to government and, and 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 do something, and he did. Another element of justice was the independent panel report delivering the truth to the world. Another element of justice is going the inquests and having it determined the longest inquest in UK history that those people killed at Hillsborough were killed unlawfully, and that the fans are exonerated of any blame. I get angry that so many people have died who shouldn't have died. They died because the state chose to cover up um, and conspire to cover up the facts of how people died at Hillsborough. The Hillsborough survivors will always be the forgotten victims of Hillsborough and they need to stand together and um, never let anyone, survivors included, create a siphon off and create a small hierarchy of acceptable survivors. They need to be down there on the ground because that's how we got things done. And that's, that'd be my message to any other campaign.